our latest state of crypto report, this time focusing on how crypto is a fairer, cheaper, and faster payment system for everyday finance. We're joined by our own Jesse Pollock, Phil McDonald, and David Duong. Uh, gentlemen, maybe we'll do start with a round of intros. Yeah, I can start. Uh, I'm Phil McDonald. I lead uh, uh, our product team around a lot of our consumer products. Um, so everything from, uh, you know, send receive functionality, USDC, staking, or, or cards, um, all sorts of things, sort of all of our, our, you know, what you might think of as banking products, payments products. I'll go next. Uh, hi, I'm Dave Duong. I'm the head of research here at Coinbase Institutional. Uh, my goal in research is to help our institutional clients shape their investment theses and refine their decision-making processes. And I'm Jesse Pollack, the creator of Base. Uh, I've been at Coinbase for seven years, and before that, I led all of our consumer businesses on the engineering side. Um, and at Base, we're an Ethereum layer two. Uh, it's open and permissionless and working to bring the world on chain and give developers and users a, a faster, cheaper, easier, safer way to, to live their financial lives and creative lives uh, on the next generation of the internet. Fantastic. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I will pepper you with a few questions from myself, and then we'll also be uh, sending over a few questions from members of the media that have submitted in advance, as well as those here on X. Um, I think, first and foremost, let's just maybe go in a uh, round robin here with kind of some key takeaways from each of you from the uh, latest data crypto report. Maybe I'll start, uh, Phil. I, you know, I was just sort of blown away by... Um, how slow the traditional finance uh, space is. I mean, I think we all experienced that. Um, and then just how expensive it turns out to be uh, for consumers. And, and that's, you know, that's really most expensive for people that are, uh, you know, have to use these services. Probably, you know, hits um, the less sophisticated folks um, the hardest, right, from a percentage basis. So, um, and I think the report just sort of spells a lot of that out. Uh, that, that was the thing that sort of stuck out to me from a consumer perspective. Yeah, um, so my background prior to joining crypto was actually uh, looking at emerging markets, like I, I covered rates and FX markets there for, for a while. Um, and I think what really struck me was the section on remittances and how crypto can help transform uh, some of those elements of the financial system. Uh, because so much of that relies on this like system of commercial and correspondent banks to really make international payments work. And it's just unfairly punitive to a lot of people. Um, so I think it kind of gets me when we see figures like, uh, you know, in the report, they estimate that in 2022, like Americans at least could have saved a minimum of around like $74 billion by using blockchain transactions. Like numbers like that are just staggering to me. Yeah. And I think from my side, the thing that really struck me is just how ready Americans are. And, and I think people all around the world for change. You know, if you look at the numbers, the, the vast majority of folks are looking for ways that we can make the financial system cheaper, faster, easier to access. Um, and I think of people who own crypto, um, you know, the vast majority of them believe that crypto is a tool that can do that. That crypto is a tool that can upgrade the system. And so, you know, I think when we're looking at the, the current climate, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk around like, what is the utility of crypto? And you, you actually, if you ask people, they're like, oh, this is a new technology that's going to let us solve all of this frustration that we have with money and our everyday experience of money by um, making it way easier, faster, cheaper, and more accessible. And I, I think it's 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 uh, encouraging to see that people are already making that connection, um, even in the you know early stages of crypto that we're in right now. Speaking of America, obviously it's an election year here in the U.S. and for 52 million Americans that hold crypto um, and are experiencing some of the financial burdens of the traditional financial system and the increased costs for kind of just living everyday life, maybe we can speak to some of the uh, current financial burdens from the traditional financial system and how crypto can alleviate those for, for your average American as well as broad crypto users. Yeah, so I can lead off from a, you know, consumer perspective. Um, you know, you see this uh, across a lot of different ways. I, I think, um, you know, certainly people who are using this for, um, 
you know, things like remittances, uh, you know, their everyday payments, um, you know, that is just a very expensive um, thing. And, and, and so, you know, if you look at uh, the opportunity a lot of crypto presents with, you know, things like USDC, L2s, you know, um, you know, bringing those costs down to, you know, near zero, uh, bringing those speeds down really fast, um, you know, it, it, it can just solve a lot of problems that, that today, you know, turn out to be very expensive, um, where people are paying, you know, 8% to send a remittance or something and, um, you know, some large percentage and, uh, and, you know, that just adds up, right? So um, that, that's how I see it. I think uh, payments too, you know, like, so obviously like, I think remittances are a huge deal, but even just like closer to home, you know, crypto payments themselves, they're like 5,000 times cheaper than traditional methods. And, you know, we really talk a lot about how crypto in a lot of ways can start replacing elements of the traditional financial system, like, like credit card fees. You know, these tend to be fairly corrosive, you know, like, you know, it, it, this is bad for the consumer. It's bad for the merchants. The merchants are spending like, uh, you know, like three, four percent on fees at a time, for example. And we think that that burden is being shouldered by those merchants. They're not. They're hidden in the price of our goods. You know, so at the very least, I think that this is going to create competition in that space. And that's important because, you know, like, it, it's not necessarily a super fair comparison always to say, like, well, these are credit card fees and you get something out of that too, right? You also are borrowing, really. It's short-term borrowing. So, like, how does that kind of measure up? Well, the thing about this is, like, disrupting that fee structure is huge because it forces these credit card companies to reduce those fees because right now, they aren't really finding themselves in any real competition with anyone else. So they're able to offer leverage, sure, but these are like super high interest rates of like 20, 25%. Like disrupting that is massive, you know, like, and this isn't just, I think, the, the payment sector as well. It's probably going to be DeFi as a whole because I think that the idea of accessing that short term leverage comes at a real cost. Like there are strings attached that really just buries people in debt. So I think that once you start seeing this kind of creep in, the traditional financial system can be upended from the top down. And I would say that we are going to see that, you know, the way DeFi does loan approvals, the way they, they do like credit card, like scoring and identity, like verification. I think all this stuff is what's going to change in the traditional financial system. Yeah. I mean, just to double click on what, what David said there, you know, he mentioned that, that, you know, average credit card fees are around 3%. If you look at small businesses, uh, you know, around the world in the United States, average margins for small businesses are about five to 6%. And so that means if they do $100 of revenue, on average, they make 5 to $6. If you think about three of those dollars going to credit card fees, we're talking about you know 50% plus of um, a business's margins being consumed by these fees. And so I, I think crypto is going to be able to dramatically drive that down, be better for consumers, be better for, for small businesses, um, and, and create a lot more eco economic opportunity in the world. I'd say another big place where um, I expect crypto to, to have a pretty positive impact um, is that if you, th if you just think about like um, payouts and payout times, um, if you're an you know, everyday uh, kind of American, you're probably used to a biweekly payroll um, or a monthly payroll. I mean, that means that um, oftentimes you have to resort to, to things like payday loans or um, uh, other tools that can help you get your capital faster. Um, with crypto, you can get paid out every day. You can get paid out every minute. You can get paid out every second. Um, and that means that you have faster access to the money that you've earned. Um, and it means you're going to be less dependent on these kind of uh, legacy uh, extractive systems that have cropped up because um, the legacy financial system is so slow and painful to interact with. One of the, uh, the questions that we got in uh, around this topic is that, you know, in the U.S., we might not see, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you're going to the store every day, you might not currently be transacting with, with crypto or, or stable coins. Um, but what are we seeing internationally with uh, stable coin and uh, crypto usage, particularly for payments and things like remittances? So uh, I'll take the lead here. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, over the last year in particular, Things have really exploded, um, particularly on the stablecoin side of things. Um, certainly, we've seen some remittances happening, and, and that's growing, and, and we're seeing more and more of that. But um, you know, we've seen things as simple as 
people in some of these emerging markets, they, they in the local market, maybe they have, um, you know, runaway inflation issues. You know, you might have heard of Argentina or Turkey or, you know, there, there's a long list of these these markets um, that have big inflation issues. And so, you know, we, we see these users um, flocking to, uh, you know, stable coins. Um, and, and why are they doing that? It's to escape their local currency, which tomorrow is going to be worth, you know, maybe a year from now is going to be worth half as much as today. And so, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, you know, we, we in the U.S. oftentimes complain about inflation and single-digit percentages points and, you know, how difficult that is. But, you know, if it's 100%, it's like 10x worse, right? Um, so, uh, so that's driving very, very large inflows to stable coins right now. Um, and I think, you know, the second order effect of that is that now people are holding money in crypto, right? Um, you know, in Nigeria or wherever. And, um, you know, when they go to actually transact, if their money's already sitting in crypto, it actually becomes potentially simpler to transact in that. And there's obviously a tipping point there, um, which in some markets we're starting to see play out. Um, so I think, you know, it's still green shoots and early, I would say, but... Um, but it's very interesting, and, and you know, as those the cost of transaction become more and more attractive to consumers, and they're able to get away from some of those corrosive, you know, um, fees that that we talked about. Um, you know, I think this starts to get really, really attractive over time. Yeah, I would just kind of add to this that you know there there have been reports that look at the study of how crypto adoption fares in you know let's say developing or emerging market countries and you know there's a genealysis report which has like a top 20 index for global crypto adoption and what's striking me about that is that if you look at it the majority of countries that are adopting blockchain and crypto these are pretty much all in emerging markets like there's only four now that top 10 uh, i'm sorry top 20 list that are actually not in em countries so i think this shows just how important crypto is especially for these lower middle income countries for the reasons that you know phil definitely pointed out as far as hyperinflation in a lot of these countries, which is, of course, eroding the value of their, like, their currencies. But, you know, like, we take this for granted in the U.S. that we have a stable currency, which, you know, of course, uh, is the reserve currency of the world. In the U.S., at least, uh, you know, these, these developing, uh, excuse me, these developed countries have the infrastructure. They're inefficient, but they have the infrastructure. But in a lot of these other places in the world, they don't actually have that. So that's where these alternatives and, you know, we turn into crypto is so meaningful. So I think that that's something that gets lost by, by a lot of people in the U.S. or in developed countries who look at this stuff and say, well, what do I need crypto for? Like, what, what is the use of this blockchain technology? What benefits does it actually give me? Well, in a lot of ways, like all the things we've been talking about, the speed, the low cost, the accessibility, like those benefits may not be pertinent to you in your everyday life now. But certainly, like in other places, it's it's a huge factor. Yeah, and this is exactly what we're seeing with Base because you know we we, we only launched Base six months ago, but I think people are starting to see Base as a really trusted place to build kind of the next generation of financial applications on chain. Um, and I think some of the places where we're seeing the most exciting adoption um, is in those regions that David's talking about here, where you have less uh, kind of stable economies, and so folks are looking for kind of a global um, trusted platform uh, where they can save their money, where they can build their businesses, um, and. So we've been working a lot with folks in um, you know, Kenya and Nigeria. We just did a, a partnership with Blackbird and Onboard um, where uh, we're enabling folks to on-ramp uh, from their local currency into USDC on base. Um, and then they can save, uh, they can do peer to peer, uh, they can build new applications. Um, uh, and I think that that sort of innovation, I really feel like we're just at the very beginning of seeing the kind of long term effects. Like today, most people are just doing the simple thing, which is, you know, they're, they're living in an environment where they don't have access to a trusted financial system that can give them surety, and they move their money into one where they do. And I think the next thing that we're going to see over the next, you know, six to 12 months is um, folks are going to now build the next generation of financial applications on top of that trusted system. And it's going to unlock huge amounts of um, creativity, uh, business efficiency, um, uh, and really, again, you know, build the next generation of our financial system um, on chain. Another question that we've gotten in, um, particularly pertaining to how we can scale and speed. Um, obviously, it's, it's very impressive that crypto payments um, can be up to five times, five thousand times cheaper than traditional methods. But um, with that number, then why are all transactions not currently on chain? Um, are, does the network support it, and kind of where are we with that? 
Um, yeah, and uh, I can jump in here. Um, you know, I think when we first launched crypto, you know, Bitcoin 10 years ago, it, it cost, you know, dollars to, to do anything. It took, you know, minutes to do anything. Um, Ethereum, uh, you know, it was faster, right? It was like now we're talking block times uh, that are, you know, less than a minute um, uh, and fees that are still about the same. And I think the thing that we saw with Ethereum is it opened up kind of this new world of applications that could be built on crypto. Um, uh, and so one way of thinking about Ethereum is that it's kind of like an app store where it's a global app store where you can build new finance, financial applications that anyone with an internet connection um, can have access to. But um, the problem with Ethereum is, you know, like Bitcoin, it still has pretty high fees. Uh, and so if you wanted to send USDC, that might cost, you know, three or five dollars. Um, or if there's a lot of demand to use the network, maybe even ten dollars or twenty dollars. Um, and for, you know, most everyday people around the world, that's not uh, a price point that is actually accessible to them. And so what's happened really just in the last couple of years is we've started to see the rise of um, layer twos. Uh, and these are things like lightning on Bitcoin uh, and then base on Ethereum uh, that enable you to run the same applications that people have been building on Ethereum, but make them, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times cheaper. And so now sending USDC instead of costing a few dollars or, you know, having a lot of demand and costing tens of dollars, I mean, it costs cents. And, you know, with up upcoming upgrades to network, it's not just going to cost cents, it's going to cost a cent or less than a cent. And when you have that sort of, you know, 100x, 1000x scaling improvement, um, A, it makes it way more accessible to, to people, like everyday people, but B, it opens up all of these new use cases um, where now you actually can do peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, really quickly um, uh, that are low cost. You can do, do local commerce. Uh, and so I, I think we've really kind of crossed a threshold just in the last uh, maybe six to 12 months where all that technology is ready, the, the costs are really low, and we're starting to see that next wave of adoption um, uh, and the next wave of innovation starting to crop up on layer twos like base. And, you know, I, I would say this is an evolution over time. I think, like Jesse said, like a lot of the, the kind of core infrastructure layers just finally now are actually like really getting there, um, you know, and, and getting, you know, as good or better, right? Uh, which is a huge enabler in terms of cost and speed. I think that's like a key unlock. But, you know, as we get there, it's not like everyone's going to be buying their coffee tomorrow because, you know, um, the network suddenly got faster. There's a network here effect at the, the payment layer. So, you know, Coinbase's approach has been to um, find places where crypto can, can offer really differentiated, uh, you know, value. So, so, for instance, you know, if you want to hold your cash in USDC, you can earn 5.1%, you know, uh, rewards on that, um, you know, in, in Coinbase. And, and that's pretty fantastic. I mean, you know, it's probably better than anything else you could do out there. Um, and then if you want to spend that, there's a card. Now, that crosses over to the traditional uh, rails, right? It makes it usable at Starbucks or whatever. Um, and, you know, we think that's really valuable to, to unlock the value of, of that, that uh, um, those tokens, you know, that you can go spend them at Starbucks. Um, and, but, you know, at the same time, you know, eventually we want to transition that, even that transaction of Starbucks, into, you know, a, a lower cost um, rail uh, using crypto. We want to bring those costs down to zero over time. Um, but we're kind of doing it piece by piece and trying to provide, like, you know, amazing value to customers as we're doing it. One thing that kind of strikes me when I listen to uh, Jesse and Phil is that, you know, the numbers we throw out sometimes like seem completely normal to us, you know, like, uh, you know, Garrett was mentioning that payments on the blockchain network can be 5,000 times cheaper. Like the speeds are, are insane, right? Like we're, we're also talking about processing payments from like 24 times to like 432,000 times faster than traditional methods. And like these, these numbers are, you know, to, to layman are like staggering in a lot of ways because it's it's kind of odd to kind of accept that, but if you just take things let's like, away from those like large magnitudes, just in terms of the brass tack itself, like wire payments, those fees are usually around like fifty dollars. Yes, like you know what Jesse was mentioning about Ethereum, you know, like now we're we're having other L two solutions that are cheaper than Ethereum, for example, but it's still way cheaper than uh, fifty dollars. Like even if we're not talking about the scales of like hundreds of thousands of times faster or, you know, thousands of times cheaper, like just, just comparing like, you know, apples to apples, the numbers are just so much better when you look at crypto. Yeah. And I think we've, we've talked quite a, a bit throughout this uh, conversation so far around just this, the sheer speed of, of transactions on chain. 
Um, can we contextualize that speed a little bit more compared to what we're seeing through traditional finance and kind of what we think the, the micro implications are for the end user and then the macro implications that, that come with that? Yeah, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but, you know, I think we're, we're all used to a world where, um, you know, you do an ACH payment uh, and it takes days. Um, you know, it's closed on the weekends, it's nine to five. Um, and uh, I think with crypto, what we're seeing is uh, you can actually send transactions and they settle instantly. Uh, and you can set up things like streams, for instance, where, you know, rather than paying every two weeks someone for, for doing their work, you can actually pay them every second. Uh, and they can kind of claim that value whenever they want it. And I think what that's going to do is it's just going to really increase capital efficiency um, uh, and make it so that people have access to their money sooner, businesses have access to their money sooner. Uh, and that, I think, is going to just open up a lot more um, economic freedom uh, because, again, people are going to be less dependent on kind of these, like, uh, Band-Aids that we've put over uh, the legacy system uh, that's so slow, um, like, you know, payday loans where they have to pay really high fees um, in order to get the liquidity that they need. I think about the uh, macro implications of these things a lot. And I mean, if we think in broader terms about what does it mean to actually have low transaction costs, faster settlement times, well, you can get more done. I mean, let, that's really the, the brass tacks of it. Like more economic activity is going to be enabled if you do this. You know, people are going to be able or maybe even more willing to kind of purchase goods and services once the payments are actually seamless instead of having the frictions that are currently involved in it. You know, like a, a topic that I think a lot about is tokenization, for example. And, and I know that tends to be more pertinent to a lot of institutional investors. But one of the reasons why institutional or rather tokenization has come back as a theme in a big way is because it's so much more expensive in terms of the interest rates that are involved in it right now that sitting on trying to settle uh, an asset, settle, settle, you know, trading a security or trading an asset for two plus two days on 5% interest rates is very, very expensive. I mean, we're talking about costs in the hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars. So this is meaningful to actually have, you know, instantaneous atomic settlements when it comes to uh, crypto payments. Yeah, and maybe the other thing I would lay out a little bit is, you know, the, the fees are not felt equally throughout um, by people in, in the ecosystem, right? The, the fees are, are felt most acutely by the folks who are the smallest and the, and the least positions of power, of least sophistication. Um, you know, and, and, you know, remittance is a great example, right, where people are losing like an immense amount of the money. They've, you know, literally moved across the, the world, you know, and sacrificed much in their lives to achieve it. You know, they're losing much of that. So I think you'll see um, sort of like the little guy win as, as the fees go down and, um, you know, things get a little flatter across the curve. Um, and, and I think that's a, a huge win for just like people, society, the world in general. Mm. One thing as we uh, kind of start to get closer to time here, when, when we look at builders that are you know building on L2s or, or uh, products like base, what are the things that we're currently seeing that help aid in the, the scalability of, of payments and uh, sending of assets? And what are the things that we're most excited for or, or wish future builders would, uh, would jump in and, and help build? Yeah, um, great question. And I think um, the thing that gets me excited and out of bed every day is just how much innovation is happening on chain right now. So if you're a builder listening in right now uh, and you're interested in building on chain, uh, there's not a better time to be getting involved. Just in the last six months, all the technology has become ready and the things that people are starting to build are incredible. And so we want to support you building. Uh, we want to support you building on base. We want to make sure that you can build this next generation of the internet with us. I'd say some of the stuff that we're really excited about, um, obviously USDC, you know, having programmable money that you can build financial experiences around that can move instantly at sense from a cost perspective uh, that's accessible to anyone in the world unlocks a huge, huge, huge amount of leverage um, for, for, for teams who are able to basically now build financial apps that are global from day one instant from day one, very low cost from day one. And, and uh, you know, I think we'll unlock the next generation of kind of fintech as we know it. 
the 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 next thing that I'm I'm really excited about is really these kind of programmable finance applications or decentralized finance applications, DeFi that that folks have uh, you know been talking about for the last couple of years. We are seeing people build lending products and borrowing products, trading products that do uh, you know what people have been building financial legacy systems for for the last hundred years, but do them online, uh, do them on chain, uh, make it so they're really cheap, really fast. And, and totally trustless. So you don't have to depend on one entity for, uh, you know, you trusting them with your money. Instead, you can be your own bank and you can get access to really world-class financial services. And so, again, if you're building in payments, if you're building in, in finance um, and you want to be building on a secure, uh, trusted, safe, easy-to-use, low-cost platform, we really want to support you building on base. I would say that uh, things that I'm looking forward to, you know, I think right now we've talked a lot about the web two kind of analogs in terms of like payments, other things I think about when I think about, uh, you know, putting more things on chain tend to be things that we've already seen in traditional, in the traditional internet space, right? You know, like social media, for example, gaming, I think those things are going to happen, but I think we're going to see a lot more well-defined crypto specific use cases things like decentralized identity and, you know, like decentralized uh, physical infrastructure, for example. And I think these things tend to be buzzwords inside the crypto communities, but they're very real as far as what they represent in terms of something that's very unique to blockchains themselves and have a very big unlock for how we just do things in life. You know, like they're, they're very relevant to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and it's not very far off. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm just seeing more and more folks building applications that, um, you know, just solve real user problems, real user needs, um, and I'm seeing more and more of it every day, um, you know, built on top of things like USTC, built on top of, you know, low-cost uh, blockchain rails like, you know, um, Base and, and, you know, many others, um, and I think that's just amazing, and, and I, I, uh, I think that's a big unlock for, um, for these things going mainstream for us. As we approach the last kind of three to four minutes here, I really just wanted to get uh, your kind of closing final thoughts on, on both the report and uh, kind of anything that we haven't touched on. I'm, I mean, I'll just close out by saying I'm, I couldn't be more bullish about where we are in this technology adoption curve. I think that we've all been kind of waiting for the last decade of when are we going to um, see really this takeoff and I think it's been slower than people have wanted but just in the last six months it feels like the technology is finally ready and I think we're starting to see green shoots of adoption and you know it's it's uh, happening everywhere it's happening in finance it's happening in payments we're also starting to see it happen in social you know I wouldn't be surprised if the next conversation that we do uh, like this we're doing on Farcaster, which is an on-chain social network that's open uh, to everyone now. Uh, you can sign up at farcaster.xyz. Um, and uh, I think couldn't be more excited to see all of this innovation happening on base. Uh, so I guess my last thought is if you're, if you're building on chain, we want to support you. Um, you can shoot me a, a note on Twitter or, or Farcaster. Uh, always here to help. I, I guess I would just say like, this is our moment. Um, you know, and I, I've, I've lived this in, in other past lives. Uh, you know, when I worked at Google, I, I saw the, the mobile flip. Um, and uh, these, are, these are special moments, and there's core unlocks underneath that enable all of this. I think we're seeing that unlock happen now. And I think this is the moment to go build your application that, uh, you know, caters to users' real needs and, um, and really focus on, uh, you know, how do you solve core problems for people. Right, uh, and how can crypto uniquely differentiate that? And I know that's what we're we're trying to do right now at Coinbase and a bunch of different places. Uh, and I'm just really excited about what that unlocks for for you know the world, economic freedom, lots lots of different angles here. I, I, I can now kind of wish that Phil had gone last because I loved how optimistic that was, and and I would love to just kind of end on that note. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I will kind of carry that through because I think that we've had a lot of hurdles. Uh, over the last two years. And I don't think that's, you know, we can't deny any of that. But we've all seen a lot of building. And that's, I think, has been fantastic for the crypto space because we've seen infrastructure getting built, more people kind of realizing that, hey, this stuff has been fun to play with and the technology is really cool, but we do need 
improvement in it. We need to improve the user experience, for example. The interfaces need to be better. We need to actually uh, be able to do more things and actually tie ourselves to, you know, what people are doing in the real world, what the real needs are. And I think we're getting there. I think that there are some real use cases out in the field. Um, they're being tested at the moment. We're very, very early still in the state of the, the crypto adoption curve. Um, but I think that we've seen so many catalysts happening in 2022, 2023 that have got us to this point. So, I, you know, I echo the points that Jesse and Phil made. I am very optimistic about this. And I say this as a person who generally tries to be fairly neutral about things. Uh, but I think that this is going to be a very, like, important, like, watershed year for the crypto industry. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we are we are definitely uh, in exciting times and, and the future is bright. I uh, just want to thank you all for your time. Um, thank you, everyone that, that tuned in to listen, and we will catch you all in the next one.